Good morning, everyone. My name is Thor Halverson. I'm president of the Human Rights Foundation. And it is for me a great honor to join you at Universidad Francisco Marroquín for their 50th anniversary. And a very special thanks to UFM for having me here today. Let me start off with a quote from around the year 20 BCE by the Roman poet Horace. Our parents, worse than our grandparents, gave birth to us who are worse than they are. And we shall in our turn bear offspring still more evil than us. For thousands of years, each generation has been skeptical about the competence and talent of the next generation. And seldom has the senior generation not prophesied the demise of civilized society due to the antics of the new generation. So my question for today is this. Is there really a problem in higher education or are baby boomers and millennials simply just misunderstanding Generation Z, as every generation before it has misunderstood the generation that followed? I think the data on this subject, which is being measured across the college campuses in the United States and in other places around the world, like Canada, the UK, and Spain, suggests that what is happening with Generation C is rather different than with other generations. This has been studied at length by social psychologist and NYU professor Jonathan Haidt in his most recent book, The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure, which he co-wrote with my former colleague at FIRE, Greg Lukianoff. I am going to be drawing heavily on their findings. The numbers are telling. After remaining more or less flat in the 1970s and 80s, the rates of adolescent depression declined slightly from the early 90s through the mid-2000s. But since 2009, the percentage of teenagers from ages 12 to 17 who have reported to have at least one major episode of depression has increased, especially among young girls. Suicides by children from the age of 5 to 11 have almost doubled in recent years. Children emergency room visits for suicide attempts uh, or suicidal ideation rose from 580,000 in the year 2007 to 1.1 million in the year 2015. This increase is also present in adolescents aged 15 to 19. And since the year 2010, the percentage of college students who say that they have a psychological disorder has measurably increased. So what is the reason for this increase in depression, anxiety, and suicide rates? What is happening to Generation Z? And why are they so vulnerable? Why are they so fragile? And the suicide rates, why are they so self-harming? Perhaps more important and relevant to our conversation today, what are the ultimate consequences of this on campus life, including university culture, and the freedom to openly debate and discuss the merits of competing ideas? Research on this subject suggests several potential culprits. For instance, despite decades of evidence that helicopter parenting is seriously counterproductive, children today are perhaps more overprotected, warier of adulthood, and in need of more therapy than ever before. In his 2018 book, The Self-Driven Child, clinical neuropsychologist William Stixrud argues that today's parents deprive children of the meaningful control over their own lives, putting them at heightened risk of anxiety and depression. He explains that, quote, children don't need perfect parents, but they do benefit greatly from parents who can serve as a non-anxious presence. By depriving children from unsupervised play, for example, the shielding of children from every possible risk, parents may be leading children to react with exaggerated fear in situations that aren't risky at all and isolating them 
from the adult skills that they will one day need to master. Therefore, parents should not try to protect their children from an increasingly overwhelming world. If we want to prepare children to withstand the thousand cuts of everyday life, such as the basic Socratic method in college, they should be allowed to encounter obstacles. A likely second culprit for abrupt shifts in the behavior of teenagers and their emotional well-being, which has direct implications on the current state of higher education, is the use of social media. According to San Diego State University professor Jean-Marie Twang, the arrival of the smartphone has radically changed every aspect of teenagers' lives, from the nature of the social interactions to their mental health. These changes have affected young people in every corner of America and in every type of household. The trends appear among teens from poor and rich backgrounds, teens of every ethnic background, and teens living in cities, suburbs, and small towns. Wherever there are cell towers, there are teens living their lives on their smartphones. These changes have taken on multiple forms. For instance, the number of teens who get together with their friends nearly every day dropped by more than 40% from 2000 to 2015, signaling that physical interaction has been replaced by virtual interaction. Teens on social media are more likely to be unhappy, and those who spend more time than average on non-screen activities are more likely to be happy. Generation Z, or as we may call them, the social media natives, are also different in how they go about sharing their moral judgments and supporting one another in moral campaigns and conflicts. Social media has fundamentally shifted the balance of power in relationships between students and faculty. Faculty now increasingly fear what students may do to their reputations and careers by stirring up online mobs against them in the event of a disagreement or a conflict, given that social media makes it extraordinarily easy to join crusades, to express solidarity, or to express outrage. So within this context, with more anxious, fragile, coddled, and easily mobilized Generation Z entering college around the year 2014, 2015, our conversation leads to the third likely culprit, driving the culture of safetyism we see today in higher education that is so incredibly toxic. College campus administrators and faculty members have welcomed and promoted the idea that students are at permanent risk of harm by ideas that they may find incompatible with their own or those that are not quote unquote mainstream. According to Haight, college administrators are enabling and promoting the same patterns of distorted thinking among students which psychological treatments like cognitive behavioral therapy try to alleviate. Among the several cognitive distortions, and all of these have medical definitions uh, and paragraphs, if not entire books on them, catastrophizing, overgeneralizing, dichotomous thinking, and emotional reasoning. For far too long, American universities have tolerated what can only be described as the rejection of open inquiry and debate. Indeed, many students have become anti-free speech activists on campus, shutting down and threatening opening, open inquiry. There have even been some instances in which demonstrators have gone as far as shooting fireworks at police, breaking windows, and starting fire in response to a particular campus speaker who may actually affect their very fragile minds with a phrase or two. Freedom of thought, expression, and inquiry are principles which institutions of higher learning must commit to upholding and must continue to defend. Any institution who fails to uphold these basic principles will categorically fail on its most fundamental goal, the search for the truth. In the United States, the bare minimum that institutions of higher education need to start doing in order to turn the tide on the culture of safetyism that has unfortunately become prevalent on college campuses is to join initiatives that address the current attacks on freedom of inquiry head on, such as the University of Chicago's principles on freedom of expression, which are a statement of intent 
committing the institution to upholding freedom of expression on university campuses. The principles highlight that, quote, fostering the ability of members of the university community to engage in such debate and deliberation in an effective and responsible manner is an essential part of the university's educational mission. Universities in the United States need to do what Gabriel Calzada was mentioning earlier today. They need to allow space for a real conversation. Chicago's university has expressed that an education that fosters free expression empowers students to engage with challenging ideas in college and throughout their lives. Further, there should be clear non-obstruction policies for protests, which should be implemented by colleges and universities. Members of the university community should, of course, be free to protest. However, it should not be in any way that would otherwise prevent other people from speaking out and expressing their own viewpoints, such as heckling or other disruptive or harmful actions to sabotage events. Finally, universities should include viewpoint diversity. It's a kind of diversity as protected on campus. It should be. This would simultaneously safeguard freedom of expression and the ultimate goal of institutions of higher education, which again is the search for truth. Colgate University implemented a task force on academic freedom and freedom of expression, similar to the one that was created um, in 2017 in Chicago. They represented a range of people and viewpoints, and they compromised students, faculty, staff, and the Board of Trustees. They reviewed the university's history of academic freedom and freedom of expression, and they drafted a statement similar to the Chicago Principles. Members of the task force frequently held meetings with other members of the university community in order to discuss relevant issues, and they created a space that encouraged all voices to be heard. As they mentioned, quote, when considered separately, we have admirable goals. When these goals are viewed together, they aggregate to form a much loftier ambition to share knowledge and foster understanding within a rapidly changing and diverse world. These timeless pursuits are relevant to all universities that seek the truth and support robust deliberations that empower students to form ideas, exchange ideas, challenge ideas, and most important, to refrain from suppressing ideas. It is such a joy to be at a university that suffers from none of these issues that so terribly afflict higher education across the world and most especially in North America. How wonderful that here we can actually discuss in detail the profound importance of retaining freedom and how we may go about this task. Thank you very much.